politicians get ready to rock on a mission. Each one of us shares our own vision. When I was on the yard, I went real hard. While I patrolled the streets, all the G's I meet. When I was on the yard, I went real hard. While I patrolled the streets, all the G's I meet. While I really got to stay woke. I like to thank God above. I like to thank God above. God above. I like to thank God above. God above. I like to thank God above. Information gathered and released for this episode and other episodes was gathered through my own personal experiences and interviews while dealing with gangs out on the street or in custody. I also read many C files, confidential sections, and background notes of police and corrections records. In addition, I was privy to intelligence reports by police and corrections agency for my work and research. Thus, I was able to gain an accurate description of individuals and document events that transpired, I realize some of these things are still viewed from the eye of the beholder, but I stand by most of my information or I would not release it. There are no huge secrets revealed here. I do not release much info from active cases, especially if it has not been adjudicated yet. Most of my information has been validated and proven in a court of law. This episode is the first of many overviews that will cover street and prison gangs, key figures, and methods of operation. I'm your host, Gabe Morales. For your information, I had to put logos over some of my picks after they're stolen by certain individuals. That's unfortunate. Many of these pictures were one of a kind. Many were taken by me or given to me with the promise that I would take good care of them by veteran gang investigators. There are several channels covering the Mexican Mafia, also known as La M and other prison gangs. Some are very good, some not so good. This is my own take on the gangs, and I'm sure some will differ with me on some of it. That's okay. Just for a point of interest, I wrote a large chunk of the document shown here and have dealt directly with many of the individuals discussed in this episode and future episodes and have researched information regarding Sureños and the M.A. for over 40 years. I am not perfect, but I do do my homework and think my work is fairly accurate. My career in corrections spanned for over 30 years, but I dealt with gangs even before that. My life literally depended on keeping track of them and have kept score for decades. I started off working at the notorious Folsom Prison, working most of my time at Sacramento County State Prison commonly known as New Folsom, and the California Department of Corrections, also referred to by its acronym, CDC. I received numerous awards for my work regarding gangs during the course of my career, and I was the founder of the International Latino Gang Investigators Association. Over the years, I've spoken at dozens of gang conferences presenting on such groups as La M and Sureños. I was appointed to the Washington State Governor's Gang Study Group, taught at a statewide corrections academy for over 20 years to all corrections agencies in Washington state, as well as being a gangs instructor at the police academy for all Washington police agencies. I worked at the King County Jail in Seattle for 24 years where I was the official gang liaison, attending most police intelligence meetings. Among my many duties, working classification as a program specialist and later as a unit supervisor, was identifying gang members' background and entering them into a gang database, which was shared by law enforcement agencies. I soon found out that security threat groups, as they're often called in corrections, were consistently responsible for being involved in approximately 50% of the fights and almost one-third of all rule violation reports, which are infractions that are written within correctional institutions. While these disruptive individuals only made up between 5 to 10% of the King County Jail population at any given time, security threat group members often make up a higher percentage in other U.S. facilities. This underscores the importance of proper safety and security identification in spite of some officials being in denial 
of these evidence-based facts. My grandfather did time at the Washington State Penitentiary in the mid-1940s to 1950s for manslaughter. I first became familiar with the Mexican Mafia in Washington State via Mexican Mafia member and Washington State godfather, Jose Cruz Lucero, also known as Jimmy Joe or Noodles. He was the president of the Convict Chicano Club at the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington during the late 1970s. Now I realize there are some people who doubt there was ever any direct California ties to Washington State regarding prison gangs. Yet some were also not aware that there was a Hawaiian MA faction. I dated the daughter of Lucero's right-hand man who ran a ex-convict program in Seattle. I was also a protege of a guy from Austin, Texas, who was a former federal convict that ran a revolutionary library in Seattle and visited Pinto's or convicts at McNeil Island Prison and other prisons in Washington State where several Mexican Mafia members were housed. For instance, Mexican Mafia assassin Alfie Sosa was released from McNeil Island in 1975. You can read more about this, my dealings with Jimmy Joe, fellow MA member Richie Serrato, Robert Mosco Saldano, and many other MA members or associates in Washington State in my auto bio, The Life and Times of Abato Loco. In the top left picture, you'll notice several members raising their hand. This symbolized the black hand of the Mexican Mafia that was borrowed from the Italian Mafia. Here are some variations of the black hand design. Here we see Jimmy Joe, far right back row, standing next to Robot Salas, a major LA drug dealer raising his hand and a key figure in Mexican Mafia politics for many years. In addition to being schooled by convicts tied to La Eme, I learned from many individuals like Robert Moco Murillo, the very first California Prison Gang Task Force Coordinator, who arrested Joe Morgan, alleged godfather of the Mexican Mafia, three times, as well as arresting shot caller Topo Peters in Mexico and many other Mexican Mafia heavyweights over his career. Moko shared with me details about Miami that very few people know. I helped Morel write a couple of his books, and he helped me with several of mine. On the upper right, you will see Morel getting an award from Comandante Salvador Girales Barrera of Mexico for the capture of mass murderer Alfie Sosa. I also learned from very early prison gang investigators like CDC's Tony Casas and Danny Vasquez. Casas was also an early member of the Prison Gang Task Force and advisor on many films, including a convict education field called Ya Basta. Vasquez was also an early Prison Gang Task Force member and portrayed himself as the warden in the fictitious film Blood In, Blood Out. In addition, I communicated with people like former Folsom Warden Robert Borg, who verified everything in my Prison Gang book. I also spoke with other CDC administrators and many gang investigators in California and other states over the years, making my own conclusions. The Mexican Mafia developed in the late 1950s to early 1960s at the Dual Vocational Institute at Tracy. It was predominantly made up of Mexican American inmates from East LA and Maravilla areas, but also had such notables as Luis Huero Buff Flores from Wine Gardens and Rodolfo Cheyenne Cadena from Bakersfield. While I was not there when they first formed, I have been involved in starting several organizations from the ground up. So I highly doubt that it formed right overnight. As with any group, it takes some time to convince people to buy into an idea and to join an organization. Guerrero Buff was soon able to convince key individuals that the Mexican Mafia could control criminal activities inside. And with individuals like Cheyenne Carena, later controlled the outside prisons. Here's a group photo of some very early members from different neighborhoods or barrios in Spanish. This is where many refer to La Eme as being a gang of gangs. La Eme soon established a loose alliance with the Aryan Brotherhood to fight against the Black Guerrilla family and West of Familia prison gangs. While there has been tension amongst some Aryan Brotherhood and Mexican Mafia members at times, this working relationship has held relatively steady for decades. The Mexican Mafia virtually took over San Quentin Prison and many other prisons and were largely untouched until an incident occurred in September 1968 over a pair of shoes. Inmate Hector Mad Dog Padilla was from San Jose in Northern California 
and was associated with a newer prison gang called Nuestra Familia Mexicana that had secretly been established a few years earlier. Padilla had a pair of dress shoes that were taken from his cell. The shoes ended up being in the possession of Mexican Mafia member Robot Salas, who wore them out on the yard. Padilla then accused Salas of being a thief, and Salas stabbed him in his cell for this verbal attack. Multiple violent skirmishes broke out right after the incident, which just so happened to be Mexican Independence Day weekend. Several convicts were wounded on both sides, and a Mexican Mafia supporter was killed by the Nuestra Familia Mexicana. The prison went on lockdown on September 16, 1968, as investigators tried to sort out who was who and what was what. Contrary to proper belief, there have been Mexican Mafia members from Northern California ever since the gang's early days. Also, all the original founders of Nuestra Familia Mexicana were from Southern California. Back then, in the 1960s, you were either Mexican Mafia or non-Mexican Mafia, unaffiliated. You were with Nuestra Familia Mexicana or other gangs like Familia Cinco, a gang totally separate from both organizations. It really did not matter where you lived. It mattered who you ran with. Many younger members and associates today don't even know why they still feud. It's been going on for decades. Most of them all in prison, you know. And um, you did time in California? Yeah, I did a lot of time in California. I've been to, uh, I went to Chino and I went to Bosom and went to uh, 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 CMF South, uh, uh, the southern part of uh, Vacaville. And so uh, when you were in prison, uh, did you, uh, were you involved in gangs at that time? Oh yeah, I was a Sureño. Okay, and what barrio were you from? I'm from, a, I'm a, uh, I'm about to call you St. Louis, okay. East LA, right in the heart of LA. And when you were involved in gang activity in, in uh, Los Angeles, did you fight other gangs? Did you fight other Sureños? Definitely, man. You can't walk down the street without getting a fight with some other neighborhood that you don't get along with. And what was the majority of the friction over? Why did you guys gangbang? It was all behind. It was like either either somebody disrespecting your neighborhood, crossing you out, you know. Uh, one of the homegirls, one of the homegirls did, you know, get raped. So we had to go take care of it. We had to start start spelling with our neighborhood, you know. Uh, just at parties, you know, you know, lots of party and everything. They part of another neighborhood, and you know, they get crazy and end up, you know, shooting one another or something. And uh, obviously, there's no Norteños down in Los Angeles, but uh, definitely. <laughs> but uh, when you went to prison, did you guys uh, fight against uh, Norteños there? All the time. We and, were always locked down. And what was the reason for the friction uh, with those guys? You know, brother, man, I couldn't even understand what 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 was, what was all behind. You know, I all I know is you know back in the early '70s, a lot of got a lot of got disrespected for another lot to spit in the stew. You know, and ever since then, you know all. It's been nothing but down here for the Lhasa, man. Bato's been killing each other, you know, uh, uh, behind the red and blue uh, flags. And uh, so you think you, a lot of these young kids even understand why, they, why they, they, they're hating on each other? They don't, even, they don't even know why, you know. They're just doing it because, you know, because it was, you know, LA's known, you know, every, across this nation. Everybody wants to be a movie star, you know what I mean? So they're all trying to, you know, fit, trying to get in where they fit in, you know what I mean? So, you know, it just... You know they don't they don't know why they're doing they're doing this they don't know why they're they're killing another waffle they think while the mexican mafia and later subservient sereno gang's official color is blue that was not always the case and this late 1970s picture of mexican mafia members and associates in the california department of corrections you will know one is wearing a red bandana as the split and gang rivalries deepened the nf and most norteños chose red as their official color while the Mexican Mafia and most Sorenos chose blue. But there are exceptions, even today. By 1970, as the California Department of Corrections shipped more and more hardcore Mexican Mafia members from San Quentin and the Jessment Center and other prisons to Folsom, they took over that yard. Folsom was a level four yard, and 4A building was considered the end of the line by staff as far as hard cases, and often referred to as the end of the world by convicts. Of course, there were exceptions, but this system remained largely in place until the security housing units were built at Tehachapi, Corcoran, and Pelican Bay in the mid to late 1980s. 
Each prison still had segregation units. For instance, I worked at New Folsom's Violence Control Unit and CDC hard yards like beef facility. While it is true the California Mexican Mafia has never had an official number one or overall leader, Joe Morgan was made the honorary godfather by Cheyenne Cadena prior to Morgan's release on parole in 1972. Morgan was as close to being the number one that ever was, and he was in fact called godfather by several members. He actually baptized their kids. And he immediately began organizing major dope deals in Mexico, distributed via Mexican Mafia street operations. This included Miami taking over inmate programs and street drug rehabilitation programs as first advised by the very intelligent Cheyenne Cadena, and this model was copied by other members. Some people bring up that Morgan slept on his sister's couch when he was arrested, thereby indicating he was some kind of homeless bum. But Morgan always dressed sharp and carried himself proudly. While he may not have run around carrying wads of cash, lots of people owed him favors, and he carried those around in his back pocket. He took Jody Gibbs as his wife after he had Mexican Mafia member Richard Grumpy Garcia killed. While I heard of Joe decades earlier and continued to hear staff and convicts refer to him as a major player, I would not personally deal with him until 1991. Contrary to what many people may think, Joe was not an original Mexican Mafia member. He was not made until approximately 10 years after they started. But he was a legend in his own right by the mid-1940s, long before the Mexican Mafia started. While Morgan had no Mexican blood, he was considered a Chicano, talked and acted like one, and as a teen joined East LA's Ford Mataviea gang. He also knew and worked with members associated with LA's Italian mob, as did a few others in the organization. Emmy icon Rodolfo Cheyenne Cadena was killed on December 17, 1972, after failed peace treaty talks with the Nuestra Familia. This caused total separation of known members between the two warring factions by the California Department of Corrections. The Shoe War incident and the killing of Cheyenne Cadena by the Nuestra Familia, ended up causing very deep divisions on prison yards. Again, it should be noted that nearly all of the early NF leaders were from Southern California, and some MA members were from Northern California. But by the late 1970s, the state had largely been carved up by Mexican mob in the South and Nuestra Familia in the North. CDC separated the two prison gangs, and they started a validation process around this time. The Monterey Park Prison Gang Task Force started in 1972. The name was later changed to the California Prison Gang Task Force and was formed to deal with Mexican Mafia murders that were happening out on the street. This task force started after the body of Mexican Mafia member Alfonso Apache Alvarez was found shot to death near a bathroom at Garvey Ranch Park, located within the city of Monterey Park. It was later determined that MA members Kilroy Royball and Alfred Alfie, aka Little One Sosa, did the hit. Sosa was from Happy Valley and later confessed to multiple murders. He was housed at New Folsom Prison in 2021 and later died at the end of the year from health issues. Kilroy was from White Fence Gang in East LA and later became a reborn Christian and died in January 2021 as a free man. As I said before, the Mexican Mafia ran several programs. One of them, Project Get Going in Los Angeles, was about to be exposed by Ellen Delia who was married to the program director, Mike Delia. Ellen served as its secretary, grant writer, and co-founder. She was suspected by Mike of talking to authorities about the Mexican Mafia execution that he was involved in of Robert Lewis, an aide to California Senator Alex Garcia. Mike was also involved in the murder of Isidro Fritos Trujillo in January 1977. Trujillo was a resident of a halfway house that Delia ran and he was killed in Palmdale, California, on a property that Mike's father owned. His father had known ties to the Italian mafia in L.A. Mike had his wife murdered on February 17, 1977, after she had traveled from L.A. to testify up at the state capitol. She was picked up by Mexican mafia members, killed, and her body was dumped near the Sacramento airport. Earlier that day, prison gang task force members, including Robert Morrell, picked pictured here points to the general area where Ellen's body was found, held a meeting about Mexican Mafia activities, including several recent murders. The Alien Delia case ended up being the longest trial in California history up to that point. 
numerous Mexican mafia members were rounded up for several murders regarding that case and others. Arrested with Sosa was Armando Mandi Barrera, who agreed to testify and became a government witness against other Mexican mafia members who were involved in several murders. You can also read about some of these late 1970s movies of La M in some good books written by Ramon Angel Mundo Mendoza, who hailed from Barrio Nuevo Estrada in East LA. As mentioned previously, as time went along, La M recruited more and more frequently among Mexican gangs in Southern California. By the late 1970s, many of these gangs started putting a 13 after their name, paying homage to La M by symbolizing the 13th letter of the alphabet, which is M, or La M in Spanish. It should be clearly noted here that not all Sureño gang members, even in Southern California, are foot soldiers for La M. In fact, many don't personally know any Mexican mafia members, but most have heard of them and look up to them and fear them. La M will only recruit the cream of the crop, the ones they feel that will most benefit the organization. The Mexican mafia will gather intelligence and decide if some Sureño gangs or specific individuals from those gangs should be placed on hit lists or if they should be given passes not to be hit or killed. This correspondence discovered by custody staff is discussing MA business via a hit list. The MA makes a lot of their money by taxing Sureño gangs. Here we see Lopez Maravilla refusing to pay and boasting they are tax free. It should be noted that most Southern California gangs do pay a tax or homage in some way to the Mexican mafia. They have representatives who go around collecting taxes. These are usually not members, but associates. Robert Robot Salas participated in many of the first documented MA murders in San Quentin. He was a major player in the shoe war and became a major drug dealer after he paroled from Folsom in 1975. He was eventually busted and sent to the Federal Bureau of Prisons where he continued being a major crime figure. He was released to the streets in 1998 became involved with the Reborn Christian Organization and died in a greater LA hospital in December, 2004. The movie American Me was filmed in parts of East Los Angeles, including Hazard and Folsom Prison. Many of my fellow officers played bit roles in the movie. While I was not in it, I was personally invited for a special preview by Edwards James Olmos at the Tower Theater in downtown Sacramento before I came out in major shows in mid-March 1992. Lyme, and particularly Joe Morgan, who was portrayed very realistically by actor William Forsyth, was not happy about the film. They were upset by the way almost took artistic liberties with facts. Shai Karena, portrayed by almost as the character Santana, was not killed by his own people. When I asked Morgan if he got paid well for the film after I escorted him into the violence control unit of New Folsom on May 10th, 1992, he shook his head, no. He told me, that's all right. It will be taken care of. I could tell he was upset, and I soon knew what he meant. An inmate named Jose Joker Gonzalez was released from New Folsom a couple weeks prior on April 27, 1992. He was later convicted of participating in the killing of movie advisor Ana Lizarraga on May 13, 1992. Some say she was killed because of her role in the movie, Others say she was killed because she was a police informant regarding drug sales in the area controlled by the MA. Either way, the MA had her head. I am very familiar with Ramona Garden's housing project as my mentor, Robert Murill, grew up there. I also worked as a gunner in the violence control unit when Danny Boy Pena from Hazard was made at Carnal. Pena killed Mexican mafia member Mo Farrell with assistance of Angel Stump Valencia, who is from Sangra in 1986 at Old Folsom, just before I hired on. As a young man, Stump was a late 1970s crime partner of Folsom heavyweight Nico Velasquez. Stump dropped out in 2002 while he was housed at Pelican Bay Prison. On December 30th, 2021, longtime Hazard veteran Ricky Chico Cruz died of COVID. Prior to his death, he was housed at New Folsom. I took several ride-alongs in Hazard over the years in other barrios, so I knew many of the players from there. Laeme also murdered movie advisors Charlie Brown Manriquez and Rocky Luna, but there are differing opinions why they were killed. Luna had failed to carry out a previous Emmy hit. David Smilon 
Gallardo killed Manriquez in the Ramona Gardens, a.k.a. Hazard Project. Some say this was for his work on the movie. Some say because this was a previous act of cowardice while he was in prison. Luna was also riddled with bullets and found in a parked car in Ramona Gardens. There are other reasons given for these murders, but the basic conclusion was they had to go. In addition to being involved in these murders, Gallardo was found guilty of accidentally killing Hazard gang member Ricardo Gonzalez, who was the brother of Joker Gonzalez, the one who killed Ana Lizarraga. Gallardo also shot Hazard member Capone Madrigal to death. The entire thing was a mess. Gallardo is presently housed at the ADX in Florence, Colorado. In 1991, the MA put out the so-called MAE Day. It declared open warfare on all black gangs, no truces with them. It also devised a scheme to tax all Sereno gangs on the streets and declared no more drive-bys. Sorenos were to do walk-ups or else. While some say this rule was put out by other individuals, I personally heard the Carnales and Camaradas complain about Joe's rules. That would be Joe Morgan, while he was housed in the violence control unit. Some people give credit to Chuco Castro, others to San Ojeda. Some give credit to both, but I don't think either one of them could have done it without the blessings of Joe. People can say whatever they want now that he's dead, but he was highly revered in his time. Very little got past him as far as MA business was concerned. Like I said, he probably would be a number one if they had a number one. A key figure in the taxation of Sorena gangs during this time in the early 1990s that is often left out is Vivesi Vesi Sagado, now deceased. Vesi was a member of the 18th Street Gang and was Samoan. He is also mentioned in the short-lived Southside government movement. A 1995 news article mentioned multiple arrests and filing of a RICO case against La Eme. Included in this case, was a secret videotape made in a hotel room attended by several of the Metzke Mafia membership discussing business. They relied on murder intimidation and a bold attempt to organize drug trafficking among hundreds of street gangs in Southern California. The indictment painted a chilling picture of Los Angeles's underworld, signaling an unprecedented degree of organization and ruthlessness in a long and bloody history of street gangs. The case mentioned Benjamin Topo Peters and his rival who was engaged in a generational power struggle for control of the organization. Topo saw himself as the heir to Joe Morgan's throne. An aggressive MA killer, Tupi, also wanted control of the organization. Eventually, Tupi lost out and was hit by a fellow Mexican Mafia members in an LA federal court holding cell. Topo died of cancer while he was in federal custody in early 2001. Tupi died of a drug overdose in federal custody in 2007. During this trial, it was brought up by Topo Peters, who relayed to his prospect, later informant, Chuco Castro, if the mafia has any enemies, they're also my enemies. So long as I take care of them, that would deem me eventually to be a member. Another individual who tried to wrest control after the death of Joe Morgan was Daniel Cuate Grajeda from La Rana. Grajeda was hit by Henry Indio Carlos in LA County Jail's gang module. I had Indio at New Folsom Prison in the early 1990s. He was very cocky and a hothead, even causing problems with the Aryan Brotherhood later. Like Tupi, Cuate Grajeda and his allies, like Angel Stump Valencia, lost out to Topo Peter's faction. During the RICO trial, US attorneys presented 275 audio tapes and 14 videotapes of Mexican Mafia members conspiring to commit multiple crimes, including murder. Some of those individuals named in the indictment were George Buckethead Bustamante, Raymond Huerochai Shyrock, Black Dan Barela, and Raymond Champ Mendez. Another individual I dealt with at New Folsom in the late 1980s was Alex Peewee Aguirre from the Avenues in Northeast LA, who was also indicted on the RICO case and busted on August 24th, 1994. If you listen to one of the 14 task force videotapes, you can hear the brothers discussing whether to wait until Pee Wee is there. Pee Wee ran a lot of things in his area of the city, as well as within the jail. He did this with other family members, including Psycho, aka Little One. Pee Wee is currently doing life without parole and just recently transferred to Victorville Prison in California from the ADX prison in Colorado.
1995 RICO case against the MA left a power vacuum out on the streets. John Stranger Terziak was from a West LA gang called Rockwood. He quickly engaged in a war with Mariano Jesus Chuy Martinez and even gave information to authorities on his competition. It soon became evident that Stranger became a rogue FBI informant. Chewy also took advantage of the lack of Mexican mafia members out on the street after the RICO case. Chewy was considered a high roller and aligned himself with the Topo Peters car. Both Stranger and Chewy were later indicted and convicted to federal prison, which led to more drama out on the streets and in prison. Chewy died in custody in 2014 and Stranger is scheduled to be released in 2025. This concludes part one. Part two will be shown soon on gangsters, cops, and politicians. Please hit the like and subscribe button so you are notified when that comes out. Thank you and stay safe.